All right. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. So we have people joining from all over the world. And uh, Julie Egginton is our speaker joining us all the way from Utah. So <laughs> welcome to Consilium. My name is Lisa Sipenko and I head Consilium Scientific. So today we have a super exciting topic. We've been talking about precision medicine, particularly in oncology, on many, many sessions. And today we get an opportunity to get inside the subject from a very specific point, talking about uh, genetic testing and what might be going wrong with genetic testing. Um, and Julie is a top expert, a serial entrepreneur with commercial and non-commercial companies. Um, I already have tons of questions for Julie. So uh, Julie, please go ahead. Uh, we'll look forward to, to your talk. Certainly, thank you very much. And um... I'm going to jump right in to explain why, uh, just give you a little bit of backstory about why I started a nonprofit called the Center for Genomic Interpretation in 2017. And, um, and then that will, it will help you understand why our mission is what it is and what we do. So I have a PhD in biochemistry, um, University of Wisconsin-Madison is where I got my PhD and I did a postdoc. And then I started at a laboratory here in the US that's fairly well known called Myriad Genetics. And I ran their variant classification program. So this is when we, um, Myriad Genetics was focused on hereditary cancer. And we, everybody carries many variants or mutations. And my job was to run the team that would interpret those, which ones caused hereditary cancer and which don't. Because most, most genetic variation is actually very benign. All right, so I worked there for four and a half years and um, built up some, you know, had great experience there and everything and um, decided to go do something else. I wanted to try different types of environments. And so I joined a startup back East. And um, that's when I learned that genetics, clinical genetics was not the same in, um, in, across all the laboratories. And uh, this company no longer exists. And it was, um, it was focused on pediatric genetics. And there was just a lot of really non-evidence-based things happening, a lot of fishy stuff happening that I wasn't comfortable with and nor was my boss. And so we really worked to make improvements in the year that I was there. Then I got uh, recruited to 23andMe in, um, in Silicon Valley. And, uh, and we were working on a new product to bring next generation sequencing to the masses. And we were working closely with the FDA to do that. And... Um, yeah, I just learned a lot of things from that experience as well about how uh, the fast pace aspect of Silicon Valley health technology companies work. And uh, when, when that run ended after about a year, when 23andMe decided not to launch a next-gen sequencing product at that time, which was, I think was a smart idea, um, I started consulting. So uh, me and another guy, we started a consulting company. And so this was in, uh, this was in 2016. And so we started going around to major, major, very large diagnostic laboratories here in this country who could afford us. And our job was to, uh, the scientists would hire us because they knew, knew they needed to make quality improvements. And um, the scientists would hire us, we would come in and we would find many more problems than the scientists even realized they had. And then we would sit down with the CEO who didn't, hadn't really realized we had been hired and we would, um, you know, go over our written report. And every single time we did that, these experiences ended in the same way. They would end up with us, with us, with us saying, okay, um, of the positive reports that you are issuing between 30 to 50, five, zero percent of them are false positives that you can avoid if you um, make improvements to your, to your program. And you also, by the way, have a lot of other technical issues leading to false negatives and all these other problems. And the CEO, every single time, went the exact same way with these companies. The CEO would always say, uh, are you under non-disclosure? And we would say, yes, we are. And we'd say, and he'd say, okay, um, so you can't, you can't tell anyone about what you found here. And we'd be like, nope, can't tell anyone. All right. Uh, is any regulatory agency overseeing the things that you've described and they're going to shut us down? We'd say, nope, no regulatory agency in this country oversees these issues, even though they impact, drastically impact patient care. And then the CEO would always say, okay, uh, so you want me to invest millions of dollars to improve a problem no one knows we have and no one's ever going to find out we have and reduce our positive rate of testing in half. 
And we say, yes, because it's the right thing to do. And the CEO would always say, no, not going to do it. So we did that for less than a year before it became soul crushing. And we realized that all the incentives in the United States are aligned in a way that it doesn't help genetic testing companies or laboratories or academic centers improve. They, they, there's, there's no financial reason to, um, to do the right thing um, any more than the minimal that is required in this country at this time. And so we decided to uh, reorganize into a nonprofit. So in 2017, we reorganized into the Center for Genomic Interpretation. And our mission, uh, while we bounced around for a while trying to figure out exactly what we wanted our mission to be, we landed on this, which was um, Center for Genomic Interpretation's mission is to save and improve lives by encouraging careful stewardship of clinical genetics, genomics, and precision medicine. At first, we tried working with laboratories, um, thinking that we could you know, do some business models, lower their costs, help them do better. They didn't want that. Uh, and so then eventually we just followed the money. And now we primarily, we work with um, insurance companies and uh, sometimes pharmaceutical companies. And also uh, we do research projects with, with patient advocates, et cetera. So that's what we do now. And we have a broad insight into how this industry operates. So let's just set the basis that we all know. What is precision medicine? Well, the, the whole goal of precision medicine is we wanna get the right treatment or the right drug to the right patient at the right time. Sometimes people will say at the right dose. And um, while genomics and genetics is not the only thing that can be used for precision medicine, it does form a linchpin. Uh, and so I pulled a quote here from 2016 that says genomic analysis, a linchpin of precision medicine has been experiencing a significant cost reduction, in, uh, a significant reduction in cost, enabling wider use of this technology. And that's true. The actual cost of doing sequencing has decreased. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean the cost of interpreting the sequencing data you find has decreased. And we'll get into that, why that causes a problem later. But this has allowed a, a basic explosion of um, different type of DNA and RNA sequencing methodologies um, that because of how the USA regulatory system works or doesn't work, has allowed a lot of junk science to be used in the clinic and doctors and patients are unaware of it. So the major points I'll be making today, I'll be talking about the patchwork of regulation in this country. I'll be talking about the low bar of proficiency testing and transparency in this country. And I'll be talking about what's wrong in terms of like the analytic performance and also the variant classification, how we interpret this DNA and how this is, these problems are leading to um, unacceptably high false negative and false positive rates for something that we market as being part of precision medicine. But it's really just a roll of the dice, whether or not you ended up as a patient getting your test in a precise lab or an imprecise lab. The problem with this is that um, globally, is that, the, is that particularly with what we call variant classification, is that there's these international databases that are used where the mistakes that are made in the US propagate to other countries. And so this isn't just a uniquely United States problem. And so just be aware of that as we talk. Okay, so um, I've put in a few slides here because often when I give a version of this presentation, people are like, Julie, <laughs> I know you've used all this peer reviewed literature and all this research data uh, to demonstrate this, but if this is as bad as you've demonstrated in this presentation, how could doctors and patients not have noticed? That's not possible. So. I've thought about that long and hard, and I just put three slides together to explain what I think is going on. Okay, how could they not have noticed? And the first is, it's actually really hard to notice a false positive or a false negative genetic or genomic test report. So let's look at an example here in this top right of a gentleman who um, has, let's imagine this guy has cancer and uh, he, his physician has ordered, he has some type of solid tumor and his physician has ordered a, a comprehensive genomic profiling test to try to match a drug to his type of cancer. And let's say that in reality, he had a really good biomarker, a really good genomic biomarker that had a, a really robust drug associated with it. Um, but this, the laboratory that was used didn't detect it, all right? So they, they return a result that is unhelpful to the clinician. So the clinician is just going to use standard of care for this patient. They're never ever going to know 
that they missed an opportunity to use a precision oncology drug. All right, now let's look at this um, very sick child on the left. Okay, and this, um, this is one of the cases that riles me in, in ways I can't even explain. All right, so um, there, there's a big push, um, and, and so far a fairly successful push, for, uh, for adoption of whole exome and whole genome sequencing in this country, particularly for very sick babies and children. And um, the problem is, is that due mostly to uh, imperfect variant classification, so um, how we interpret the DNA variants that are found, the false positive rates of these tests are extraordinary. And while that might be acceptable if the child is at the end of their diagnostic odyssey and um, you know they've tried everything else and nothing has worked, now they've given a, what they don't know is a false positive. They just think it's a positive rare disease diagnosis. Often that is celebrated as, oh, thank goodness, uh, we've reached the end of, our, of the diagnostic odyssey. So the problem here is though, that there's an effort, a very large effort to move these, um, these pediatric whole exome, whole genome sequencing tests, not to the final last resort, but an upfront tool. And if you do that and you misdiagnose a patient upfront, because in some of the mathematical modeling we've done, you know, more than half the time, these kids get a false positive result. You might very likely end up diagnosing the patient incorrectly and if there's no orthogonal biochemical test that you can do to confirm your diagnostic, your, your genetic diagnosis, which often is the case for rare disease, uh, you might end up taking that kid out of, out of care and putting them on, on palliative care. You've ended their diagnostic odyssey too early and you've basically sent that kid home to die. And in fact, uh, the, the studies that have been written about the NICU and pediatric setting of whole genome and whole exome testing has shown that um, there is no improvement in mortality. There's, there's, no, there's no outcomes improvement, but there is a financial improvement for, um, for the health systems. But that financial improvement is occurring because you take these kids out of the system. You, you end their diagnostic odyssey, which again is fine if the result is accurate, but if it's inaccurate, uh, you, you've done a disservice to that patient. Um, but no one ever questions it, or they rarely question it. They do sometimes question that, but they rarely question it. And that, that's a tragedy, is that we're not questioning these results. And then, of course, I've put a picture here of a woman that's had a mastectomy. And um, often, if a patient in certain types of cancers, like hereditary cancers, some hereditary cancers, if they get a false positive genetic test result, the organ or tissue is removed, like just fully removed that would have potentially told you over time that they had received a false positive result. So this woman who's had her breast removed was never at increased risk for breast cancer if, if she received a false positive, but we'll never know that because her breast tissue was removed. So it's really hard to catch these things, which is why I think nobody's noticed. Okay, so the other, the other issue here it's a broad misunderstanding in the United States about what the, the uh, accreditors, the regulatory agencies do. And we're gonna spend a lot more time talking about this, but uh, you'll often hear when I'm, when I'm tasked to talk to a doctor, they'll say, don't worry, don't worry. I know there's problems in this industry and I only order from reputable labs. And I'm like, how do they know who the reputable labs are? I mostly don't even know who the reputable labs are. Right, and this is like my field. So, um, but what are these doctors meaning by reputable labs? Mostly they mean whoever the hospital pathologist is sending the sample out to, and they like the hospital pathologist. And so, you know, they trust that, that it's getting sent to a reputable lab. But if you talk to the hospital pathologist, what they mean is that any lab that is clear or accredited. Okay, but the problem here is that and I'll get more into this, is that CLIA and CAP are both laboratory-based certifications, meaning that they're going in and making sure that the laboratory has the basic um, infrastructure to do genetic and genomic complex testing, right? But the what it's actually looking at works only for very, very 
uh, simple tests, very, very easy tests. Whereas the current complexity of, of genetic and genomic testing has gone well beyond what CLIA and CAP inspectors are uh, capable, of, capable of looking at in the brief time that they're inspecting a laboratory. So um, we've, we've moved past the ability for CLIA and CAP to mean that, that uh, if a laboratory is awarded this, you know what, that they're reputable. Um, and then the last thing um, is this, there's also doctors also and, and, and patients as well, think that if an insurance company will reimburse the a test, a, a, a health insurance company in this country will reimburse a test, that that has meant that has gone through um, some type of robust evaluation. And in some insurance companies, that is mostly true, but in many, it's not. Okay, and, and part of this boils down to the fact that years ago, um, there was a big effort in, in the germline, in the hereditary um, genetic space to get coverage for rare disease testing. And so this, this was pushed to say, you know, we can't prove clinical utility of these, of these tests to you in ways that you're used to seeing clinical utility, right? Because these kids, we just need a diagnosis. These kids are sick. Um, we need a diagnosis, there's no treatment, and um, you know, it'll end their diagnostic odyssey, and the diagnostic odyssey is costly and expensive. So uh, let's, let's move the definition of what demonstration of clinical utility is for, um, for these early low volume genetic tests, and let's be compassionate about what that means. And so the, the target was changed from demonstration of improved patient outcomes Two, there's a change in patient management. So the doctor now thinks, okay, I have a diagnosis and um, I'm gonna change my management for this patient in some way, which might include, I'm no longer going to try to search for what's wrong with them. And they're no, now going to go on just symptom management or palliative care, right? So, so um, that was done compassionately. And I think it was, it was probably the right thing to do for that limited scenario. But the problem is that that has held on in the industry so that the so the industry no longer thinks much. Of the industry no longer thinks I have to prove that my test works to improve patient outcomes. They just have to like, oh, my test works enough that I frequently get the doctor to do something else. The problem with that is now you're financially rewarding false positives. And so now there is economic and marketing pressure in order to give as many positives as you can to doctors on tests. And that has just degraded a lot in this system. We've got panels now that have too many genes on them that are experimental in nature. They've got too many biomarkers, they're disproven. There's a lot of pressure to lower the bar on variant classification to give more positives. And so it's all kind of run amok because of this very early at the time, potentially correct thing to do which is to change the definition of clinical utility. So these things combined have, I think, allowed um, users and stakeholders of clinical genetics to think that this industry is better off than it really is. And then also just the magnificence of like rebranding genetics and genomics into this precision medicine field has also done a lot. Okay, so let's talk about what's going on here in the US and the patchwork, the very messed up patchwork of regulation that allows tests that don't work, that are often harmful to patients to actually flourish. Okay, so there's a term that's very important here in the United States called laboratory developed test. Uh, there's a definition, I'm gonna shortcut the definition of it. And what I'll tell you is it's any test that is, clinical test that is not FDA approved that was developed in a laboratory. So that means you're not getting this test out of an FDA approved kit, right? This is any test that a hospital lab or commercial laboratory has designed. And sometimes those tests are marketed heavily and they can be um, potentially very lucrative for these laboratories. That is what a laboratory developed test is. All right. Now, the National Institutes of Health has a web page dedicated to this. They are not a regulator of testing, but they are very, very, very worried about what's going on in this country. And this is what they have to say. Most genetic tests today are not regulated, meaning that they go to market without any independent analysis to verify the claims of the seller. Why is that true? Okay, so the only robust 
uh, current regulator in this country that will actually carefully look at the clinical claims and the analytic claims made by a test is the FDA and sometimes the New York State Department of Health. Uh, these, but very few, less than 1% of genetic and genomic tests in this country have been evaluated by those regulatory groups. The rest have been evaluated, uh, not even evaluated, the tests aren't even evaluated. The labs that made the tests have been evaluated by CLIA and or CAP. So let me walk you through this carefully. What is CLIA? Okay, CLIA is frankly ridiculously out of date for genetics and genomics. In the United States, to run genetic and genomic testing, the minimum you need is a CLIA certification. I could literally fill out the forms and be permitted to run genetic testing in my garage for about two years before anybody comes and inspects. And I could be running tests and, and like doing them for doctors anywhere in the US out of my garage and it'd be two years before anyone came to inspect. Even with that, it's hit or miss on whether or not the CLIA inspector knows what they're looking at. And they're inspecting the lab, not the tests being issued by the lab. And basically the regulations are from 1988, they're way out of date, they're pretty much irrelevant. I'll also note that when I get, get to talking about the FDA, we might see the FDA begin to have oversight over all these tests that I'm talking about as early as this year. And um, the, the folks that oversee CLIA, which is the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid here in the US, are actually supportive of <clears throat> the FDA's oversight of tests. And so, you, so CLIA sees itself more as we oversee um, the maintenance of laboratories, make sure they're following best practices, their chemicals aren't out of date, their employees, the right type of employees, <clears throat> whereas the FDA would regulate the tests themselves that are coming out of the labs, which seemed like a good approach. Um, <clears throat> okay, so as a higher bar, uh, so the College of American Pathologists, or CAP, have more stringent rules for different types of laboratories. They have a checklist that's very specific to genetics and genomics, and <clears throat> they've been deputized by CLIA in order to um, do both the, the CLIA certification and the CAP accreditation. Again, though, keep note that this is a laboratory level evaluation. Uh, they'll spot check one or two tests, but they're not looking at all the clinical tests out of these laboratories. It's also a self-policing group, okay? CAP is run by pathologists. It's for pathologists who police pathologists. So this is on their website, and they're also an advocacy group. So CAP advocates to ensure regulations protect patients without overburdening pathologists and laboratories. So they, um, by the very definition, of, of their tax status as a certain type of nonprofit, which is different to our type of nonprofit, they have to uh, make things lives easier for pathologists. So they have pressure from their membership to keep the bar as low as they can without getting in trouble with the public. And so, and that's what they do. Um, so, and how, how does that play out, okay? That plays out because we were involved with a study. Um, so Cell Gene Bristol Myers Squibb uh, hired us a few years ago to just do something very simple. They had a, a patient disease registry for um, called the Connect Myeloid Disease Registry. And they had a bunch of genomic test reports. And they simply wanted us to get 50 plus patients, take the findings on these genetic test reports and put them in a spreadsheet and standardize them. That's all we were meant to do. What we found when we tried to do that, and this was from 23 different labs of which 20 were CAP accredited, all across the US, they were ran these reports were randomly selected. What we found was that it was a dog's breakfast. We couldn't like, these reports were of such low quality. And when we presented that to the, um, and these were clinical reports guiding patient care. When we presented that to the scientific advisory board over this disease registry, they, um, they asked us to, to help <clears throat> write a paper about it. And we did, and it was published late last year. Um, <clears throat> and what we found is that the CAP accredited labs were actually not following CAP guidelines. And here's a summary, and I'm not gonna go through it, but here's a summary of all the failures that were like really common that are against CAP guidelines. They're on these reports. And um, <clears throat> the, the summary statement in this was, 
This pilot study demonstrated that limitations in the accuracy, transparency, and consistency of genetic and genomic laboratory reports make the standardization, collation analysis, and interpretation of high quality data across laboratories and providers impossible. Basically, we like there was such bad air, there was stuff on these reports that couldn't even exist in nature that was guiding patient care. And these were from CAP accredited laboratories. So if you think about how this works, you appear are policing a lab who next month could be in your lab policing you, right? The self, and so it, it for a lot, a lot of times, it means that they're gonna be a little bit too easy. Plus cap inspectors are gonna, they're, they're gonna come into your lab once every other year. They're gonna spend six hours. Your test menu might have 100, 200, 1,000, 2,000 different tests on it. And they're there for six hours or eight hours once every other year. They simply don't have time nor the expertise because they're not allowed to take in statisticians and everyone else needed to ensure that the laboratory is following all the CAP guidelines. So even though the CAP guidelines are excellent and if laboratories followed them, the testing quality in this country would be infinitely better than it is now, labs are getting CAP clear, certified and CAP accredited who are not following the guidelines. And this paper demonstrated that. So that's not working. Okay, let's talk about New York State. So New York State, a very long time ago, figured out that CLIA and CAP is not sufficient, that there's a lot of junk um, diagnostics beyond just genetics and genomics, but also genetics and genomics coming out of CLIA and CAP accredited laboratories. So they created um, a different route specific to just their state. And um, it's called the Wadsworth Center. And so to get... Um, to sell a test, a clinical test in New York, you have, to, you have to get it approved by this New York State Department of Health Wadsworth Center. And um, they, are very, they, they are very good compared to CLIA and CAP. It's a test level evaluation, except when it's not, because the problem is, is over the years, they haven't received enough funding and they're getting many applicants, applications for tests to review and so if they've come to like, like a lab and think, okay, you have a history of doing well, they'll approve a test for New York, New York that, um, that they haven't robustly evaluated. So the problem with that is on their website, which is hard to use anyway, but you can't tell which tests have been actually you know, gone through with a fine tooth comb by their scientists and which haven't. They don't, they don't separate the, the, the stamp that they give them. And so I call them, they're a test level approver, except when they're not, and you can't tell the difference which. But fewer, again, again, fewer than 1% of tests have actually been evaluated by the New York State Wadsworth Center in this country. Okay, the FDA is the best, but fewer than 0.1% of genetic and genomic tests have been reviewed by the FDA. And <clears throat> with the exception of a couple of tests, the ones that have been reviewed by the FDA uh, are connected to um, drugs themselves. So a genetic or genomic test has to be used in order to prescribe a drug. And so the test was um, primarily the test was used uh, during the clinical drug trials and then became the companion diagnostic and was approved by the FDA. And uh, this is a much more robust evaluation it's not perfect, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit later about you know what some of the imperfections are. But um, this is far more robust than anything else. This is a very very hot topic in the United States right now. The FDA is uh, using what's called rulemaking, which is a federal agency approach to being able to basically bring something into law without going through Congress. We can have an offline conversation about what that means for the U.S. Constitution another time, but. Uh, if, if the FDA does gain control April this year, they have a plan to ramp up oversight of laboratory developed tests over the next four years. Most of the genetics and genomics and laboratory, the, the entire laboratory industry is fighting this. Um, it will probably get stuck. If it does get signed by the US president in April, it'll probably get stuck in um, contested in the courts. Uh, might get overturned, who knows, but I personally am hopeful for this because I think this will solve 80% of the problems that we have with genetics and genomics in this country. All right, <clears throat> so one really big problem we have with, with the fact that more than 99% of genetic and genomic laboratory developed tests in this country 
being coming only from CLIA and CAP accredited laboratories is that there's no standardized way to report test metrics. They're actually um, within reason, they're allowed to make up the approach that they use to calculate their performance metrics. And so most laboratories are going to use an approach that um, is in their favor. They're going to leave out from the validation samples, sample types that they struggle with. Um, and so the numbers are gonna look really, really good. So it's not possible. So, so in this country, when one of these laboratory developed tests sits in front of an insurer and says, I have a 99.9% .9 specificity and sensitivity, and another lab has the same test and says the same thing, they haven't measured the same thing. We actually don't know if they're equally good. They, one could be excellent and one could be terrible. We don't know. You get, you, you get to make up your own approach. You get to choose your own validation samples. You get to create your own math and all those details of how you did that are confidential, right? And um, it, it's just, it's, it's a trust us, we're smart approach, which isn't good. Uh, some laboratories have taken the approach of, oh yeah, but I've published, I've published my validation. I've got like two, three, four publications on my validation. Uh, you should, you should trust that because it's published. The problem with that is that peer review is not the same as, um, as what the FDA is going to do when it goes through a validation. Most peer reviewers don't work in diagnostic laboratories. And even if they do, they don't know what's required to have a well-validated test. And so uh, you can't even trust stuff that has been peer reviewed. It might be excellent, but it may not. All right. So uh, it, it's a tough situation. What this does is it creates um, having these diff this different patchwork and different regulatory pathways can create a really bizarre scenario in this country for the few labs who, who bravely decide to follow each pathway. OK, so here's an example I spent yesterday um, going to the Tempest XT website. And um, this is all fresh from yesterday. Uh, this is a laboratory based in Chicago and they also have a duplicate lab in Durham, um, North Carolina. This is a laboratory that has uh, a regular LDT that's from their Clear Cap Labs in Chicago and Durham, North Carolina. But then they've also gone and gotten a test approved by New York who did carefully look at, um, who did go through it. And I, I'll show you why I know that in a minute. And then they've also succeeded in taking the test through the FDA, who approved a very small part of the test. Um, so there's, there's a part of the test that is FDA approved and then kind of the rest of it that is just like specked out. All right. So just to demonstrate and and, and then Tempest XT does something interesting where they, they simultaneously market the three, the, the same test in three different ways. So it is, the, it is the same test, but they market it as just the basic clear cap version or the New York version for New York residents. Or if you want to use an FDA approved test, here's the same test, but with the FDA approved stuff. So the, the, the public documentation tells you a lot about what it takes to, um, to go through these different pathways. Here, uh, if you just clear cap, there's one page, one, one page public documentation for two laboratories. New York has a 0.7 page, so not quite a full page uh, that for the test they've approved, whereas the FDA approved one required 28 pages of documentation showing all these different technical issues. I'm not going to take you through the details of this, but, but this is what you need to take home. I didn't show you all the technical information for the FDA because there were pages and pages and pages of it. I just showed you what matched up to the other technical information here from, uh, from clear cap only and from New York state approvals. In short, the numbers don't match. Okay, so, and, and the naming of the metrics don't match. And there are different parts of the tests were approved by different agencies. And so it's just, it's just a disaster right now in the United States. The fact that you can have the same test with different test metrics approved in different ways from three different regulatory pathways is insane. And it's very confusing for us to try to make heads or tails of this, which is why I really support moving in the direction of FDA having oversight. So I'm all in on the FDA having oversight, even though the FDA is imperfect in a lot of ways and I got a lot of gripes, but I think it will solve a lot of problems. However, all these regulatory pathways focus almost exclusively on just variant detection and variant naming, all right? Which back in legacy days, when all you did was you had a pre-approved biomarker, like everyone knew this one genetic variant did something important and was druggable, for example, 
and making sure labs could detect that one thing and name it correctly, that made sense that that's all you focused on was the, that analytic performance. But these days, a lot of tests have this other step where they're looking at any, an infinite number of possible human variation, human genetic variants, and they have to classify it and they have to interpret what they find. Is it druggable or not? Does it cause an increase in cancer or rare disease or not? That's what's called variant classification. And none of these regulators do a robust job. They either completely ignore it or they don't do a great job on it. Um, okay, so I've told you why the regulatory pathways are a mess. Let me show you very quickly, I'm gonna move through this, but the data that demonstrates that, yes, it is an actual mess. When we begin to measure these things, is it a mess? All right, so when I complain about the regulatory pathways, a lot of people come to me and say, ah, but Julie, there's clear mandated proficiency testing. It doesn't help, guys. Okay, so every twice a year, every clinical laboratory has to do proficiency testing, and most of that is sold by CAP, all right? But in 2019, uh, the CDC, it, with the CLIA, they're trying to improve CLIA, and I don't know if they ever will, and I'm, I'm on one of the committees, and I don't know. I don't have a whole lot of hope there. <clears throat> but they, they did an anonymous survey of laboratory directors across the country, and what the laboratory directors in an anonymous uh, survey were, were able to say is proficiency testing is too easy. Plus the fact that you can choose, you can actually choose how hard a level you do for proficiency testing. There are financial incentives for labs to choose the easiest. So proficiency testing is too easy. You can choose how hard of a level you, you take. So labs will always choose easy. Plus there's a clear rule that says you only need 80% accuracy in PT or in proficiency testing or above to get your gold star. And the lab scores are not public, right? That this is not, that you can't go to a website and see how a lab did on proficiency testing. Most proficiency testing also only looks at detection and naming, like the nomenclature or the annotation of the variant. Most proficiency testing doesn't look at variant classification. So you might have a lab that's detecting variants perfectly, but they might be misclassifying tons of what they're detecting and their results are inaccurate and they'll still pass most of what's available for, for proficiency testing. So this is a huge problem. Um, other people say to me, oh, no, 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 Julie, Julie, don't, don't worry. This drug, th th this gene was associated with the drug and got approved, the drug got approved by the FDA, so everything's fine. No, it's not, okay? Because the clinical trials that select patients, they have a very narrow selection criteria of which genomic markers they're gonna use. And that's what gets approved, and that's what the CDX is initially, the companion diagnostic that the FDA approves, is initially approved for. But once that companion diagnostic is used in the wild, that companion diagnostic has to classify many, many different types of variants that were not included in the clinical trial. It had a very narrow selection criteria. And so the FDA doesn't have oversight into that uh, in the wild um, approach to variant classification. And it can sometimes be crazy wild, all right? So uh, as an example, I'm gonna skip this slide to just say that the FDA has problems with regulating novel variant classification, any classification for which the laboratory had to make a judgment call. Here was a study that was published by the Huntsman Cancer Institute a few years ago, um, where they were looking at foundation one companion diagnostics. This is an FDA approved test. And they were comparing the classifications made by the companion diagnostic, the, the foundation one test, compared to the classifications, the exact same variants, the exact same genes, made by more experienced and knowledgeable germline labs. And the mechanism of action is the same for these two things. And what they found was that 13% of variants classified as druggable or pathogenic on the FDA approved test were classified as benign or uncertain by the germline labs that had more experience. So the FDA really struggles with this variant classification component, even on the tests that um, it has approved. They, uh, with on the germline side of things, they've, they've kind of like turned over the evidence-based requirements to these expert committees, mostly run by ClinGen. And some of these expert committees um, are excellent. They're very evidence-based and some of them are not. Some of them are, are 
just kind of opinion based. And so they're all getting the same FDA recognized uh, classification that the FDA can then use, that, that labs can then use to like get their tests approved the FDA through the FDA, but they're varying level quality. Basically the FDA hasn't been able to like figure out a good and robust way yet to, um, to regulate this aspect of variant classification that is part of testing. All right, so even though CAP uh, tends to make things too easy, um, they did a very helpful thing to the community back in 2022, and they published some of the aggregate, aggregate results for next-gen sequencing testing here in this country. Um, and here's very quickly what they found. While CAP stacks the deck of proficiency test samples to be mostly single nucleotide variants, which means they're very easy to detect and name correctly, uh, they did sprinkle in a few realistic challenges. Now, most of the interesting variants that are drug targets that cause disease are actually not single nucleotide variants. So CAP did sprinkle in some of the more interesting variants. And what they found is the second you get past these easy sets of variants for which they stacked the deck to be mostly of, um, labs spectacularly failed. They mostly failed by misidentifying what the sequencing data saw. And if you misname it and you misidentify it, you then have a hard time getting the correct classification and matching it to the right drug or the right classification that's gonna dictate the therapy. So this, this was one of the big failure points for labs. Um, the second you got past a single nucleotide variant and you got to multinucleotide variants, um, labs failed. For example, let's look at this one. Uh, two CCs were turned into two TTs next to each other. 37.5% of labs thought they were on opposing strands. They like, didn't have a data review or looking at the data to realize that they were next door to each other. So they just, they got it wrong. Uh, and that's very, very common. The second that you get past the simplest of stuff, for example, 28.3% uh, of labs can't, it will misidentify variants in high GC rich regions of the genome, which is common. Uh, in homopolymer regions, which is common, a bunch of labs, 7%, 1.3, 15.6% of labs misidentify. This is the terrifying one. Uh, one third of the human genome are these copycat genes. And half the labs couldn't distinguish the copycat genes from the real genes and were issuing false positive, false positive results for um, variants that were in the copycat genes. And yet all of these labs are still getting their gold star from proficiency testing because proficiency testing is stacked with the easy variants, right? And that's a problem. So while I'm really glad that CAP published this so we can see where labs are struggling, it's also frustrating that so many bad labs are able to continue to operate because the deck was stacked in their favor. Um, and and that's, that's very, very disappointing. Do these detection issues matter? Yes, in germline, one in every seven, so in hereditary genetics, one in every seven variants are actually these complicated variants that labs struggle with. And um, here was a study done in somatics, so KRAS, NRAS are important uh, contraindication um, biomarkers for colorectal cancer patients for a particular type of drug. Um, only 37%, so about, about one third of regular LDTs who said they could detect had very sensitive tests for these uh, actually did. When they were compared against the, the FDA approved test, about two thirds of them failed to perform as well, which is just tragic. Variant classification is a mess because again, no one's really regulating it. And it's while it's meant to be evidence-based and there are standards and guidelines out there, it's also really wishy-washy, okay? So by that, I mean in germline, we need to be able to assign the genetic variants that we find into one of these categories. There are guidelines issued by um, different organizations that work together. In short, they, uh, the guidelines, they allow you to use a lot of weak evidence to add up to give you a positive classification, which is a problem. And what we found when we did a study, we followed one cancer clinic in Colorado and doing hereditary cancer testing and they sent us every single positive report they got for their patients for a year. Um, this was a few years ago. And we looked to see if the guidelines are weak. We looked to see if the labs were even following the guidelines. And what we found was that 16% of the positive reports, pathogenic or likely pathogenic, 
it didn't even follow the criteria. They did not have enough evidence to classify them as pathogenic. Again, you'll remember I said that there is, um, there's a bias to report things as pathogenic or, or, or druggable. And, uh, and we see that um, in drugs. So in the somatic oncology side where we're matching biomarkers, so genetic variation to drugs, it's even worse because the guidelines themselves allow you to call something as positive or potentially clinical significance, even if there's just a few clinical trials or case reports, and even if they're conflicting. So baked into the guidelines themselves is an extraordinary weakness. Okay, so this came out like two weeks ago. And this is really important. This, so, so somebody wrote a book, How Life Works, and this book reviewer wrote about it. And he says, it's time to admit the genes are not the blueprint for life. And outside of just the sloppiness of labs not following the guidelines, this, what, what this addresses and what we know is happening is that clinical diagnostic labs are not keeping up with the years of evidence now that have proven that many genes are not one-to-one. -one. Okay, so the canonical gene that everybody is using from either RefSeq, GenCode, or Ensemble hasn't been well enough characterized for us to know which parts matter for disease and which don't. And so we all just, laboratories just assume that the, that the genes as we have them in these publicly available government-sponsored databases, if we find a truncating mutation or, or something that looks like it's gonna break that gene, anywhere in this gene, we're gonna call it pathogenic or likely pathogenic, right? What that has done, there's a number of papers that have duplicated this in different ways with different data sets, is that it's, it's led to an extraordinary high rate of false positive variant class patient over the years. Just focus on this left-hand side real quick. And I'm, I'm, give me just a few more minutes and I'll have this all wrapped up. Um, what we have here down the bottom is penetrance, right? So this was uh, looking at population data, the UK biobank, as well as Mount Sinai's biobank. So these are pe people that were, um, they had their exons or genomes sequenced. And then we also had the medical records and we were able to ask the question, if you have a truncating mutation, which are these, which are these ones up here on the kind of top left, if you have a truncating mutation that's meant to break a gene, that if you had been tested in a clinical diagnostic laboratory, you had an important gene that should have been broken, which means you should have had a medical condition or family history in your family of some type of hereditary condition. Uh, when we actually look at the medical records, so that the, the thickness, this is called a violin plot thickness of this shows you how many different genetic variations fell in that category. Long and short of it is most all the variants that the clinical diagnostic industry is classifying as pathogenic, when we actually look in the general population has no penetrance. Like the penetrance, it's just, it's not causing disease, which means that for decades we have been over classifying genetic variants that they are false positives. We, the first study that began to explore this came out in 2018. There's this database called ClinVar, which was only two years old at the time. And at that point in time, already 92% of genetic disorders already had too many genetic variants classified as positive by at least one clinical lab to account for population, the population prevalence of genetic disorders. Even when we set the penetrance or the express, like how many people have the disorder who have the variant down to 10%, Still 92% of genetic disorders way back in 2017, when this archive was young, uh, there are too many false positives. Also discordance rate is extraordinarily high between laboratories. This study was done in 2022, was published in 2022, looking at three labs, rotating three labs between a total of nine labs, who 12% of the time on unique variant classifications would disagree in a way that would impact patients on the class patients. They had the same variants. They, they, had, were they knew they were part of the study, they were assigned to follow the guidelines and they were just disagreeing a lot. And 35% of the time when they went back to figure out why they disagreed, it was because there was some type of laboratory error that was made, which is just extraordinary. Unfortunately, in the one study I've been able to find that looked at what this does for non-Western European patients, it impacts non-Western European patients worse because there's less data less um, database data on non-Western European patients. So if, if you're 
white Western European, you're more likely to get more accurate genetic tests than if you're not. The same thing is happening in the somatic space, only worse. I won't go through all the data because I'm going to have to stop now and tell you, but we've known for a number of years, this paper came out back in 2013. There is ex So on the somatic side, on the oncology side, so acquired mutations, there's extensive false positive finds that overshadow the true driver events, and they're leading to a lot of false positive reports. Um, I have a few more slides. Let me, let me stop. I have a few more slides, like what is happening to try to fix this, but I could also just stop here. So what would you guys like me to do? Uh, Julie, just uh, finish if you can in the next few minutes, but do show those okay. slides because it's super important how we can fix that. Thank you. Okay, so this is what's in the, the, the effort right now to try to fix this in the United States. I mentioned there's this FDA rule that might come into effect in April if it doesn't get contested. Um, what's going to happen is that over the next four years, all of these genetic genomic tests will have to go through the FDA if they want to be sold on the market. It's going to uh, improve a lot of things. Labs are gonna to have to prove that their tests work, that their analytical claims are correct. The FDA is gonna make sure that they can't market these things incorrectly. Um, it's gonna drive the low quality labs out of business because they won't be able to afford taking things through the FDA. So it's gonna fix a lot of problems. What it's not gonna fix Right. There are many laboratories across the U.S. running all types of diagnostics that right now are using FDA approved test kits. Right. But they're not using it well, because just because you have an FDA approved test doesn't mean that if you skip steps, if you don't have the right knowledgeable people doing the steps, um, you can get a bad test, even if you started with an FDA approved test. All right. So we need to amp up clear and cap and that ability to regulate those laboratories better than we are now. And that also means we need to ramp up the ability for um, the safety and the education of employees so they can do whistleblower um, activities. And I think that I think that that, that bringing the FDA um, in to have oversight over these tests, making one expectation, one regulatory pathway that's very robust, and also um, doing these other things will improve enormously as well. Our nonprofit is taking a different approach. We're not trying to be an accreditor. What we're doing is we're trying to help transparency. So we are working with insurance companies to provide them with different um, assessment tools so they can compare and contrast the highest use tests. So we are getting some adoption with health insurance companies across this country. We have um, this initiative is called Elevate Genetics Brilliant. One thing that we do for next gen sequencing tests is we have an advanced in silico proficiency test where we have a volunteer um, committee that includes patient advocates as well as um, experts in the field. They select challenge variants. Laboratories that participate in this get the exact same variants as everybody else. And we're, we're seeing if they're following all, all the standards and guidelines that come from AMP, CAP, ACMG, ASCO. Anyone that's made standards and guidelines were basically scoring these labs from tail to tip of these tests to see if they can follow it. And so um, that generates a report and then insurers are able to decide, do, should I cover this test from this laboratory or not? Should, or, you know, is, is it high quality or not? And in the pilots that we've done, some labs get half of the samples wrong. I mean, these are clear cap New York state approved laboratories and they're still getting half of the challenges wrong. Whereas other labs are getting like 90% of the challenges right, which, which you know, it's about as good as diagnostics get, right? Um, we have this other thing where we, uh, before an, an expensive drug, precision oncology therapy or um, gene replacement therapy is, uh, is approved for reimbursement, um, we'll take a look at the laboratory report and see if the laboratory got a little too creative in their variant classification. More than half the times that we've done this, um, depending upon the lab, between five to 50% of the time, a positive is a false positive due to, to overclassification. When we catch a lab having done a bad job, often they will amend the report and be like, oh yeah, we were sloppy and they'll amend it and, and make that report uncertain. For tests that are really unusual tests like polygenic risk scores, we also have statisticians to go through the validations, the lab, will give to us and we'll say, yep, your claims that you're making about this test are proven or unproven or kind of half proven. 
And then the final thing we do is an anti, um, it's, a, it's a billing fraud. So we, there's a lot of billing fraud that happens in this country and we're able to catch that through Elevate Genetics landscape. And then my last slide, I think the biggest thing that's gonna impact it is patient lawsuits. I think that as patients become more informed about um, what's going on, they're going to sue the labs, they're gonna sue the regulators, they're gonna sue the health insurance companies. And now, thanks to this law in the United States called the CAA, they can actually sue their employer who didn't do a good job of choosing a health insurance company, who didn't do a good job of choosing a genetics vendor. So um, just a couple of weeks ago, the first lawsuit under this new law began against Johnson & Johnson class action. So we're gonna see, I think we're gonna see a lot of interesting things happen in genetics over the next 10 years. And that's my last slide. Julie, thank you so much. Incredible whirlwind ride, roller coaster ride. Um, and uh, very insightful. I think we all learned a lot and uh, shocking in so many ways because this is the level of scientific detail that most people just simply are not aware of even being in the field. Um, so we are officially out of time. However, I'm sure people have questions. So this session has been recorded. If you need to leave, leave. But Julie, if you can stay online, that would be great. I welcome um, those who can raise their hand to ask a question. And while people are gathering their thoughts, we do have a few uh, questions in the chat. So first question uh, from Barbara, um, what is your definition of false positive? Do you need wrong sequence reported? Ah, uh, yes. So there's two different false positives. So, um, and depending on where I was in my presentation, I meant two different things. So when I was talking about the analytic performance, the false positive was um, either they detected something that wasn't there or they detected something that was there, but they named it wrong. And that may not end up as a clinical false positive on a patient report, um, but it may. Uh, when I was talking about variant classification, if you get a false positive there, that will almost always end up on the patient report. Good question. Yeah, thank you. So another question also in the chat is, uh, what um, what was the goal of the Celgene BMS genomic exercise that you were commissioned to do and that was published last year? Oh, yeah, the initial goal when, when we were commissioned to do the project initially was they just wanted to see if they, um, so, so in these in these disease registries, they just collect everything, right? They just collect everything. And the disease registry had started um, before genomics was really being used in with these leukemia patients. And um, but over time, more and more of these patients, the doctors were scanning and submitting genomic results. And so the scientific advisory committee uh, requested that Celgene that then became Bristol Myers, Myers Squibb actually cap, begin to catalog these to see if there could be statistical trends found and, and discovery made. Um, unfortunately, though, what we found was that the, the clinical testing was of such low quality and non-standardized and in such disarray that you, there was no way to use it in any type of study to make discovery, which was about that publication kind of stopped, stopped there and didn't want to say the next thing, which is obviously, well, if it's that bad, can doctors even trust the results? Which is the next obvious question. Thank you, Julie. Any any other questions for Julie from the audience? Julie, I, I do have a question for you. So you did sure. mention that this really difficult situation in the US, um, maybe difficult is the wrong word, but definitely uh, um, not the situation we want to see is reflecting on the rest of the world, uh, how bad or how good things are outside the US? Are they worse? Are they the same? Or yeah, they I, I don't, I'll take a guess, okay? Um, and talking to some regulators outside the US, um, I'm hearing it's about the same. And they are often very, very frustrated with the US because when a genetic a genomic test is commercially successful here in the US, they go in with enormous amounts of confidence into other countries to launch it there, this type of technology or this exact same test. Um, 
and there's a lot of momentum and there's a lot of like, well, it's been accepted in the US, why can't you accept it here? So part of it, it's not necessarily baked into the technologies. It's just, um, there's just a lot of politics that are happening as well. And so uh, unfortunately, a lot of the low quality stuff that's happening in the US is being commercially exported. Okay, thank you. Uh, but should the same legislative work be taking place in other jurisdictions, do you think? Or if US fixes it to an extent? No, I think it needs to happen everywhere. I think I think it needs to happen everywhere. I think everyone right. needs to be um, expecting a higher bar. Right. So another question in the chat as well. So do you think ethically WGS, uh, WES, uh, tests, uh, direct to consumer tests should stop until more progress is made on variant interpretation. Um, no, I, if I was in charge, which I'm not, I would actually, um, convene, con con convene, a, a, uh, you know, patient advocates, experts to talk about this, but talk about it, um, Talk about it in a way, I, I, you need to keep the people out of the room who are making money off of it, right? You need to talk about it openly and like what, there is value there, there is value. If the patient is correctly diagnosed, that is incredibly valuable. And so I would hate to throw out the baby with the bathwater. It just needs to be done smarter. All right, so um, since I'm not seeing any hands, I'll just continue asking questions. Um, another question is, uh, I guess, slightly unrelated to your talk, but maybe it is related to your talk. Since you worked at 23andMe, uh, the recent news of their market price uh, and potentially being delisted from NASDAQ and completely going from 6 billion into nothing is quite a shock because pretty much everyone I know took the test. I thought they were so, so popular. What's up? What, what, what is your- What's up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, what's up? Um, I actually, I think this is, uh, I think this is true for all of genetics and it goes back to the slide that I had of, um, of the book review that came out in Nature a couple of weeks ago of, uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back and share it because I, I really do think it boils down to this issue. Um, just give me a minute. If I can't find it, I'll give up on this. Here it is. <clears throat> I think it boils down to this, okay? When, when we sequence the genome and when we had that first draft sequence, um, and I was in grad school at the time and it was just so exciting. And we really, we, we'd we had some early wins by then, right? Like we, we, we had an understanding of cystic fibrosis and uh, we had, you know, this one particular cystic fibrosis variant really well characterized. And, uh, and we had these very, very early wins. A lot of the metabolic genes, um, you know, the Ashkenazi Jewish panels that we have that, that are very well defined. And, and we thought that's how everything was gonna work, right? We really thought that we had this one-to-one -one ratio that we would find these genes, they would have a single function. If you broke it anywhere, broke it, or what we perceive as breaking, that it would lead to a disease, a disorder, right? And we have this really, um, frankly, what we now see is very naive concept of the complexity of the human genome. And, um, I don't, I, I think that that is now catching up with all of genetics, not just 23andMe and not just consumer genetics. But if I think in the early days, we thought we would get more information, that we would wow more people, that it would help more people. This very easy one-to-one -one thing could help more people. As it turned out, it's not that. There are some genes that are like that, but very few. And so most people who are going to take a genetic test if we're actually being honest and not over-interpreting the genetic test, are going to get a negative result. And that's very underwhelming. It's disappointing if you had a clinical reason to take it, if you were doing it for fun as a consumer person and you didn't find out anything that's going to change your life, that's disappointing. Um, I think it's not just 23andMe, I think it's all of genetics. All right, so it's interesting how history chapters open and close. <laughs> 
Um, a more practical question. So uh, you highlighted the solutions lawsuits, uh, FDA legislation, these things will take time. And uh, what's going to take even more time is results from implementation of any of these actions to fix the field, to make it better. Uh, if we take short-term perspective, what should be the action plan for people who are aware of situations where they, whether they're clinicians, concerned patients themselves or their children who are being tested, especially in significant um, healthcare decisions, when the decision is yeah. based on the test, would you say definitely do second opinion? How do you push your system to give you yeah, so, insurance? So what I, so um, I talk to medical directors and insurance companies all the time on this question, like what can you do right now? Like today, what can you do? And so my answer is, if there is an FDA approved test, that is the only one you should use. And I have people freak out, like when I say that, right? Because um, they get really mad <laughs> because there are really, really high quality tests that are not FDA approved. They just have not taken that route, okay? That's true, but it's a very quick and shortcut way to get to a test that at least you know it's warts. Well, most of it's what's right because it had to prove that it had to demonstrate that you can download the information and you can read about it. So if there is an FDA approved test on market, that is the one you should choose. I have tried to do this with friends who um, have had, you know, brain cancer and I've gone to talk to their oncologist and um, it doesn't go well, to be honest. The oncologist is like, no, 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 uh, I trust. I, I, I trust who we're using. And then when I, you know, I send them papers and they're like, well, it can't be as bad as you're saying. And they just go with whoever they've always gone with. It's very unfortunate. Which is why I think there needs to be lawsuits. Um, so I think right now, if there is an FDA approved test, choose that one. Or, or you know, if there's three or four tests, go through the specs and choose the one that looks the best if it's FDA approved. If there is not an FDA approved option, this is not ideal, but um, try to use the New York State Department of Health's website, the Wadsworth Center's website. And it's hit or miss because again, they they evaluate tests except when they don't, but you don't know where it is the case, right? But you might luck out, right? So if you can't find an FDA approved test, then find one that's New York State Department of Health um, approved. That will get you almost everything. You will, uh, in this country, uh, between those do, taking those two approaches, there's very, very few tests that are well understood to be useful um, that you're not going to find on those two lists. If you're willing to wait a few more months, um, you can tell a lab that um, you want them to take one of our nonprofits evaluations. So you can say, you know, to a next gen sequencing lab, I want you to go and take an Elevate Genetics Brilliant evaluation and bring me back the scores. Um, and we have we have some health insurers now who are easing the community into that idea that they might be requiring that or highly recommending that in the future. Um, that's what I recommend doing. Sorry, these are the steps for a sophisticated user, so to speak. Uh, let's face a patient, just they got the result. They're completely shocked. Like, uh, and uh, this actually goes to the question uh, which was just posted in the chat. So the first question is, uh, do you know of good regulators outside of the US? I like the word good in this question, like in Europe. And um, regulators, in my opinion, should be regulators. Uh, and uh, we have a case of a cancer patient who did the um, NGS test with two different providers showing different results. So what now? Which one uh, to act upon for future targeted treatment plans? So this is illustration. So yeah, so you can, I mean, right now we're doing, I'll be honest, right now we do this for free. And if we get a lot of these, we'll have to stop actually charging for them. But there are clinicians in the U.S. and cancer centers in the U.S., particularly the example of when they get two different ones with conflicting results, like for some reason they send it to two different labs. So um, that, and I'll just take you to our website real quick um, and I'll show you. Um, often, uh, when if you guys just send it to me, if you... Uh, block out the the patient identifying information, please. Um, and let me just 
go here. Hang on, just give me a minute. Share my window. Okay, so this is our website, um, genomicinterpretation.org. If you're a patient, and, and honestly, I don't like pushing this um, because it's expensive for us to do. And it's actually often cheaper in the United States just to pay out of pocket to get your test run at a better lab than to do this. But uh, what we will do is um, what's called a variant fact checker if you're a patient, okay? So this means that uh, you've gotten, mostly we wanna do this for a positive result that you know that's unusual or you weren't expecting. Um, you get, or that's not a found a mutation, right? It, it you know, Maybe there's not a lot of information. So what we do is we carefully go through the information and we see if the variant classification followed the current standards and guidelines. And depending on which lab it comes from between five to 50% of the time, it doesn't. And it's a false positive according to standards and guidelines. It should be a variant of uncertain significance. Um, we'll do that. Generally what we do, I, I, again, this is really, I don't, <laughs> it takes a lot of time to make an official report and we charge like $500 for this. And I don't like to do that. So what I prefer to do as long as the volume isn't high is if someone has a case um, and I, you know, we do this like a couple times a month, the genetic counselor will contact us and be like, Hey, I, I, I'm worried about this one. And I'll just get on the phone with them and we'll talk about it. And I'll give them a few instructions of what to do. They'll go away and do it. And they'll come back and they'll tell me. And most of the time we found out it's fishy. It's wrong. It's, you know, they didn't follow standards and guidelines. Something went wrong. If there's two opposing reports, um, again, anonymize them, send them to me. I'll tell you what to do next. I, I try to make it so that I don't have to charge anybody anything for this. Um, but if it gets high volume, I will, but, uh, yeah, a again, that process only works on determining variant classification. If there's been a variant classification fault, um, I can't, I, on the, on the back end, there's no way to determine if the lab, if the analytic component of the lab was accurate or not. Um, uh, brilliant. So thank you so much, Julie. One final question for me and, uh, I promise to wrap up. So, uh, since, my experience is on the payer reimbursement side. More and more, we see um, products coming with companion diagnostics. Just like you say, those trials that have been done, narrowly selected population based on a particular companion test, or it doesn't have to be proprietary company companion test. It could be just uh, one of the next generation sequencing tests, which are already mm -hmm. available. Uh, in your recommendation, to be on a cautious side, what else... Uh, reimbursement decision makers should be aware of and what kind of information should they request to ensure uh, they get the information they need to get rather than just like you say on paper things look very good and of course pharma companies submitting documents for a decision will ensure things look very good anything maybe yeah, I think no, I think, I, and that's why we built, um, that's why we built variant classification, that, sorry, that's why we built clarity. So I just showed you variant fact checker and that's for patients. Elevate genetics clarity is, um, it's for this exact thing. This is, this is what we want uh, payers to be aware of is, um, I'm gonna share my screen again. Okay, so th these are the services that we make available to payers and other stakeholders if they if they want. But uh, let's see, where, where do we? Here we go. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yep. So what we're trying to do is we're ed we do a lot of free education to health insurance companies, and what we're trying to get them to know is yes, the drug might have been approved and it might have been approved. Um, for, for whatever reason, right? But things get dicey once you get outside of the clinical trial, right? And that's where this service really comes in. So if you're being asked to pay for an expensive precision oncology therapy or gene replacement therapy, this is where this service comes in and we're gonna say, so what we actually do is we go back to the clinical trial document and to the documentation and we say, what variant classification approach did they take um, like what was their stringency? And we're gonna compare the classification that's on that report against the original stringency that went through the clinical trial. And a lot of the time, 
really, really creative, right? Because there's, there's a commercial incentive for labs to give positives. Doctors are going to keep ordering from them the more positives they get. And so um, it's very useful to the labs to, to have false positive variant classifications. Now that makes it sound like every time there's a false positive there's been some nefarious reason for it. No, sometimes it's just the variant classification scientist was harried, had too much to do, was a bit sloppy, okay? Which isn't great, but it's also not nefarious, right? Um, and so th this, is, this is the service that we have and, and we tend to work with the insurance companies to understand how many hours of turnaround time. Often with the pharmaceutical companies, they have a 72 hour contract. They have to make a decision, yay or nay. And so we, we have to um, work very quickly on these to determine, is it just fine, great classification, go through, approve that precision oncology therapy, or you no, know, we need more information from the lab. And sometimes the lab has internal information that if we had had, we would have agreed with the lab. So we actually open up a communication with the laboratory. And if they share that information, we're like, yep, and we'll amend our report and be like, that's fine, go for it. That's a good precision oncology opportunity there. So this is this is the best um, best thing to do, I think, to deal with that. 